So what I'm about to show you is going to take about 30 minutes, right? There is a video at the end that, frankly, I think is, encapsulates a lot of, I think, why we're all here, which is really, I think, pretty neat. Um, and you're going to probably have some questions. So what I'd ask you to do is hold those questions. There's a period at the end and, you know, some refreshments in the back, and we can certainly go into that time. But I'm going to touch on a few things. So if you haven't seen this, this is a summary off of our website. And you'll notice sort of, you know, one of those infographs, you know, we I cobbled a few of these together with the team. What we have up on the website, and this is key to the entire briefing, is 475 students and counting. Okay, that's 488 today, and it's still counting. And that doesn't include uh, some of the um, international families that are here part-time. So I think total, I'm looking at Elena, Mrs. Eichel, we're up around 495. So our hope and prayer for the year was like 500, just so you know. I mean, that's where we were hoping and praying and working for it. And so, you know, we're getting really close to that. A lot of good work. We're going to talk about this theme of what enrollment means for the school, what's healthy enrollment for the school in the near term and long term, um, and how we might get there. But I wanted to just start you off there. And again, I've already talked about what, why we're doing this, and I'm going to really break it down. I'm going to cover a bit of last year, sort of how we ended 2018-19. We're going to talk about some test scores, finances, things like that. Talk about how we're doing this year, and then how we're going to do in the future. I'm just going to give you a peek to a bit of the vision and where we're going. So if I had to boil all down as I came on board in the leadership transition, this is what I saw are sort of the big things that were happening. The main focus as I joined the team was stopping the decline in enrollment. I'm going to show you a picture. This may be news to some of you. I'm not meant to shock you. I just want to tell you this is what was going on. And the focus last year, uh, Dr. Engstrom and, and Elena and many others to include um, many staff and faculty were aware of this at least generally and were working to arrest it key things. At the same time, we are prepping for what we're going to do this year is accreditation, and we'll talk more about that. But that took a major staff effort to get ready to recertify that we are an excellent school. And so, again, you need to be aware of that. And the good news is we're on track. I just met with the, the, the leader of that today. We're, we're on good uh, terms and ready for their team's visit this March, um, and we're looking forward to what that's going to mean for us for the next 10 years, because that's a 10-year investment in, our, in ourselves and how we're going to improve. And so there are two things or areas I looked. What areas do we need to sustain? And you can see the three areas I think were particularly strong from my vantage point. And two areas that I think we really need to look at. Um, and so we'll talk about math scores in particular. Among the areas we pursue excellence, we're also going to talk about finances, near term, long term. So I don't know if you were aware and how aware you were about enrollment really going back six years. So I've got on here on the graph. 2013-2014 um, school year and where we're going. And there's a dotted black line in the middle of that chart. That line is 560 students, just so you know. So that on the, on the north-south, on the y-axis is the number of students. Time is on the, on the x-axis. At 560, a lot of good things happen for the school when we're around 560 to 600. A lot of good options of what we can do, how to revitalize. Anyway, you can see that about three years ago, we start dropping away from that in a major way. And we start looking at why. But the bottom line last year was we needed to stop the decline. And the good news is we saw some, some traction last year that that was turning around. So last year, retention that fed into the 478 number, which was still looks bad, but where's the, where's the turnaround? The retention was not good. 80% for a school is not healthy. You really want to be close, 85 to 90% retention. And we were at 80%. And that was a low for recent years. The good news was is we had 116 new students. That was a recent high. So we were, the challenge was how do we retain our current students with our families um, while sustaining attracting new students? So we learned a lot from last year. We ended at 478. Believe it or not, the low point was 451. And so you can see that there was a recovery in the year up to 478. But remember the, the number 560. It's a key number as we go forward. So we looked at scores. As you know, our students are actually taking the NEWAS right now. And I actually forget what NEWAS stands for. Help me out. It's Northwest, Northwest Educational Assessment. Northwest Educational Assessment. So it's the tool that we use to look at um, whether or not an expected growth in academics is occurring. So what's the child's potential and are they meeting, meeting that growth per grade level? So, the way you read these two charts, which are summaries, for the fourth and the eighth grade, 
is that on the left side you have reading, on the right side you have math. So I'll go to the left side. On the left side you've got the National, the U.S., New Hampshire, and Portsmouth Christian Academy. And in gold are how are our fourth graders compared, and in red, how do our eighth graders compare. And what you can see straight away is PCA, our fourth and eighth graders, well outpace uh, national and state in proficiency or above. So we say the assessment is proficient or above. And so we're well over 80%. Go to the right, and you can see on math that our eighth graders are well above, but our fourth graders are not. And so we saw that last year. At the end of last year, we saw that happening, and, and we implemented a new math curriculum that some of you are seeing. It's a three-year evolution into that math curriculum, but I want you to know that we, we saw that. Uh, so that's not acceptable. Actually, that's, you know, this is a snapshot in the fourth grade. There's some soft spots in those, in those middle and early uh, primary and elementary grades. Um, but the good news is that we see that coming out, um, that eighth grade is, is pretty solid. So I want you to know that we're attacking that. We can delve into some of that in Q&A. But this is not okay. We, I want you to know that we recognize it. We know it. We're doing something about it. Let me back up. There's one slide I didn't show, and I think Dr. Lawrence makes a good point. These are scores. This doesn't talk about, and I don't have a slide ready, but I want you to know that we look at it. If a student is not capable of making the growth that we expect, for whatever reason, um, that's, so the scores are one measure. Are they reaching their potential is the other measure that we look at. That's not reflected here. Um, it's, it's frankly um, more complex. I didn't prepare that. I can come back to you on that type topic. Um, but I want you to know that, that when we look at differentiated learning, what we say we're doing, with each of your children, um, your teachers are doing that right now. And I'm confident looking at the data um, that we still have room to grow, but by and large, we're, we're, we're doing in the main what we need to do, but there's some areas, again, in, in that we're focusing on. Um, and that's an important piece, and I'll, I'll pull it apart later. But this, this clearly got my attention, and it's not okay. We're addressing it. So the big question I had was, well, how does this translate to our high school, to SATs? Again, the SAT is an aptitude test. It's looking at how people will do in college, what their aptitude is. And again, very similar in the format, U.S. to New Hampshire to PCA. And you go, hey, graphically, that looks pretty good, but is it good? Is that what we'd want? So remember, on this slide, I said proficient is about the 80th percentile. So these scores, these aggregate, so reading is in red and in this case, math is in, in, uh, in orange, are about the 70th percentile. Um, and this is the last, last year group that we had that scored. Um, in my mind, we want to be shooting for 80th percentile. Why? Not to self-validate PCA, because it's more opportunity for our students. They have more opportunities for the colleges they get into, and they have more opportunities for merit scholarship if they're pursuing it. Right? And we also know this assessment tool that, that others use. And so our thought is, as we look at it, and we're re-looking this now, is how do we better prepare our students to do tests, to prepare for tests? Right now, the onus of that responsibility is on the student and or the parent to make them happen. We have lots of tools, and we say, hey, they're available. We make them available to you. Um, you may or may not be aware of them, but the reality is that, that it really is up to each individual student. And so I want you to know we're having an internal look at what can we do to add some framing without dictating test preparation. But just like you do any type of you know, you know, physical endeavor, you need to kind of learn how to do it. We think that's a life skill. All right? How do you take tests well and maximize your potential? It's an aptitude test, so we're, they're assessing potential. So how do we do that? So I want to let you know that in my mind, we should be shooting for and helping to collectively to help our students score over 1,200 or more as an aggregate by class, the juniors and the seniors. The good news is Dr. Lawrence and others have looked at and the NEWA has a, has a projection tool. And we just looked at the analysis last year, and the NEWA's projections have been bearing out. And so what we have really for the first time is taking two tools. One is you know, the College Board and one is NEWA. And we said, there's a, there's a good marrying up here. So what I want you to know is we're looking long term. How do we know if we're on track, off track, writ large, and as we work with your individual children, we can help you go, hey, where are you relative to this? And more importantly, because each child's different, how do we maximize the potential? So another aspect that is fairly unique to PCA, and I, the more I look at it, is really challenging both to present and prepare and to do it excellently are AP classes, right? So we offer nine total. We have six running right now. Dr. Gamble's right here. He's running two of them uh, for history. 
And so it takes an incredible amount of investment on their part, but also the great benefit is it's an investment in, in future college um, testing, or am I ready for college, but also college credit, and the payoff of options down the road. Either shorter college experience, uh, more electives offered, and you understand that. The good news is um, that at one level, we're in line with other scoring. So you can feel that this sort of caught me. Only one third of American high school students take any AP course at all. So it's just like 38%. So just last year, we had 52, which is about a third of our students, took two tests. So we actually had some students who didn't take the course but took the test, right? So they're trying to, uh, to score well and get credit. But uh, just to give you a feel for where our students are and what they're striving to achieve. And so this, I think, is something we continue to look at, refine, and how do we even get greater return on the investment in the AP courses. So where are our graduates going? So last two years, 100% um, of our graduates are intending to go to college and have acceptances, in many cases, multiple acceptances where they're going. Compare that to the to US and uh, New Hampshire averages, pretty impressive. I think the other piece is where are they going? And you can see on the chart, some pretty uh, esteemed organizations and institutions that are getting them acceptance. Uh, one of the things that I've seen, again, from my perspective, is that gaining acceptance is a, is a high bar, no doubt. But what can, can you pay for the acceptance you just received? <laughs> and so this merit scholarship is one that that's a, that's a pretty big number. Um, I would, and, and hats off to the young men and women and the parents who supported them in winning those, those uh, scholarships. And so, you know, again, uh, are we preparing our students to go into the future um, into their college, and, and frankly, not only you know mentally, emotionally, and spiritually ready, but are they financially on, on solid footing? I think this is an indicator, and we can talk more about it afterwards. I'm going to shift from how we're performing academically to how we're performing financially. So two things, I don't know if you know, and hopefully you get some reassurance, is that every year since the founding of school is that we were audited by an external agency that was credentialed to do so. Every year we've passed it, we successfully passed the audit. That should give you great confidence that we are operating in accordance with you know, laws, morals, and ethics uh, on our finances. We passed again this year without any type of like comment or you know, any type of statement with any qualifier. It was a, what we call a clean audit, and that is really awesome. That and my credit goes to Sarah Levitt and others who worked hard to make that happen. How do we do in our budget? So we, we were actually executed better than we expected to do. And that was through a lot of hard work by a lot of people, a lot of watching costs, and frankly, a lot of folks that were going above and beyond to give to the school. And so that's great news. And we'll talk more about what that means in the future. The other one is we heard from you. So of keen interest to me coming in um, was obviously talking to many of you one-on-one, -on -one, but I also aggregated a lot of your parent feedback at the end of the year. And about a third of you came back to me. I'd love to see that get closer to 40%, but frankly, it's a long survey, so thank you for taking the time to do it. And this is the types of things that you told us to, to really work on and focus on and some strengths. So without going into a lot of detail, again, I'll save it for the Q&A if you want to peel some of this back, but we have already focused. You can think back of what we're doing and focusing on community, focusing on uh, emphasizing our athletics or where we see success and participation playoffs and individual performances as well as individual personal records and you, you know, stepping out um, as well as just, frankly, you all being here and communicating is a key part of that step. So thank you for helping us with that. So the bottom line is you're, you, are, you are a partner with the school, fully vested. You're sacrificing so much to be here and I will hear you and I want to make sure that you know that I'm hearing you individually and collectively. My goal here is that you not only be able to we be able to sustain that bottom line recommendation, um, but that you would do it with full heart and confidence to your neighbors and to your friends. All right, let's jump to the current year. It's a, it's a big year. I mean, we've seen God that we, you know work throughout history, the 40 years we've been here, and we're greatly encouraged, um, lar in large measure, due to you, your parents, your feedback online, as well as looking at some of those test scores. Uh, bring those two together, and it, which is what niche.com does. Um, and, you know, second year in a row, best private K-12 school in New Hampshire. Uh, look around some of the other schools, and there's some really good schools in that group. 
And so we don't sit, take that in any great pride, but we, we see it as a mark of, of per, pursuing excellence and sustaining excellence. And our goal is that uh, whether or not we receive it, we're always worthy in your minds of, of receiving something like that. The other great thing that we started to see even further, we, last year was stop the decline, this year is start the turnaround. And we'll talk about that more and some of the financial challenges and frankly some opportunities that we have. So highlights for 2020, let me, before I, I, I go, or 1920 I go in, I, you can look at this slide. Um, and there are two things I wanna highlight here. I talked quite a bit about the upper school, uh, the prior performance, and there are a lot of, we're in the upper school right now. So a lot of really neat things that are happening up here. I'm really excited about how Steve Foley has, has led the team this year and how the team has really uh, focused on community here uh, and done really, really well. Most of the things listed up here on the left are happening at the lower school, and I wanted to highlight those. Uh, some really good things that are happening. Um, and Lila right here, this is young Lila right in the middle. Um, so Lila actually pulls from both sides of this chart. I didn't realize it until after the, you know, we got this picture together. But Lila's in the Creative Design Center. That's a, a, a task, a project that she and her classmate put together. Uh, it's a new initiative. If you haven't been down there, I, I recommend you take a look at it. But one of the reasons that, as I understand Lila's and her family's story is here is because friends of PCA, friends like you, um, connected with her family and encouraged and found that this would be a good spot for, their, for them. Not, you know, and so here she is. And we're so thankful. We're so thankful for that. Again, that was not a plan. You know, we saw, I saw that pop up. I go, this is perfect. This really communicates sort of the highlight of what we're talking about, what we want to sustain and build on. And so a lot of really good things happening. I want to thank so many of you for, for working on Shine and the facility, and I will talk about that here a little bit. And uh, really, I think, what the standard for the facility that we're after. So um, if you don't know, I'm really glad to share Mr. Paul Gass is his wife, Lawyer, and back here. Paul is a neighbor. Uh, he's a PCA grandparent, uh, and, but, and, as is Lori. But Paul does a lot of the, a lot of the work on the grounds um, and has been a key advisor for me. And so Paul, thank you and Lori both so much. So, <laughs> Josh Grombaum, I love you too. And we all do. So I guess my point here is that my assessment of the facility was everybody was working really hard to keep it up, but we had to really sustain it. And we asked you and you responded to come in and help, we said, make a PCA shine um, over the summer. It was a, it was a monumental effort, um, and I, so thank you so much. But the focus, and we'll touch on this as we go forward, my aim for PCA's facilities are always to be safe, <coughs> cared for, and welcoming, right? So not gold-plated, and certainly not neglected or run down. There's a, there's a spot in the middle that we're after. And I want you to know that we can get there. A lot of you contribute so much to that, but uh, we're, we're committed to that level. Uh, we faced some challenges. The Christmas flood was a real challenge. We can talk about that more during Q&A. The good news is we're on track to get that fully recovered. Uh, we're so thankful for all those who, who helped out here. And the other one that I continue to hear from you, and I want you to know how committed we are, is to maintain the safety and security of PCA. And I, at one point, I think I saw Gene Watson in here. I don't know if he's still in. Uh, Gene is probably, if you don't know Gene, you probably recognize Gene. I should have had his picture in here. Um, but he's front and center on, on, on enabling, coordinating this as a volunteer, full-time volunteer, um, fully vested member of the community. Um, but everyone in PCA takes safety and security seriously. I've been incredibly impressed from the teachers to front door to everybody that, that your children's safety, accountability is front and foremost and we'll continue to build on, on that to make sure that this is a safe place to come. The other piece is you know, safety is not just about physical, it's about emotional, spiritual, a safe place to ask questions, a safe place to explore, a safe place to take appropriate risks. <coughs> and we want to build that, a great space community that encourages encourages your children and our students to, to stretch out. So I'll hear it back to enrollment. So if you remember last chart in the top left, retention was at 80%. Last year, coming into this school year, 86% um, of our families returned, that were eligible to return. And we had a, a large graduating class as well, 53. It's not fully, it's not factored out. You take the graduating class, pull it out, they're not eligible to return. 86% of eligible to return came back. Huge jump. That's you. 
We're so thankful that you had confidence to come back and join us for this next year. Um, actually, that number is 122. It's not 120. So last that prior last year is 116. We had a better year. So 116, the year prior, was a really good new year. We had a better year. And so what you see down here, you saw in the other picture, these are, what, what do we do differently? Well, we hired a, a marketing expert who, who knew Christian schools and knew how to communicate more effectively. Uh, we hired a marketing uh, expert here, and she developed herself, and, and, got, and we tied into a, someone who understands how to, frankly, get our name on a very clouded, or crowded information map right, of all of you. How do you find we, you know, social media and just telling our story more effectively? But the other one is practically we opened the campus more, and a lot more people came. And so Elena and many others came. Many of you volunteered to make that happen. So that's what's happening. That started the year prior, continued this year. And that's what you're seeing the results are. And it tells you that today we have 488 full-time students. That's accounting for a very large, relatively large class of seniors that got stripped out of the total enrollment picture. So this is a big year for us. This is real turnaround. The question is, how do we sustain it? So how are we doing it financially? So the good news is executing the current budget year is on track, right? So we have a budget, board passed it, we're executing, we just reviewed the data, I briefed the board next week. Um, but the bottom line is we can't keep doing what we're doing um, forever. We have to grow enrollment back towards 560 as fast as possible. What that, what, so what happens if we don't? We have to reorganize how we operate the school and restructure. And we have about two years before we have to really do that and make that hard decision. Um, the clear fact is we almost have 500 students and over 400 families who want to be here. So PCA is not going away, folks. But the way we know how we're structured and the potential that we see that if we do this well and right, that's what we have to get to 560 and do again and climb to 600. So I want to lay, lay that picture out for you. So we're watching it very closely. The board's aware of it. I'm letting you know on some of it this is a real challenge, but I think I'm confident that we can overcome that, the key is finding great young families such as yourselves and telling the PCA story and if this would be a great fit for them. So seek support beyond PCA, key aspect, and we're already doing that. We're reaching out, which, you know, many of you, you know, one of the things I want to, you know, we'll we keep coming to you and you keep giving and we will continue this relationship, but I want you to know we're looking for help outside the PCA. Um, we're talking Q&A, what that looks like a little bit, I can't get too specific, but just know that We've got a great faithful cohort here, and we're looking for outside help. It'll be different and look different, but we're going after it. Developing those relationships. We're committed to, to delivering excellence in everything we do. We strive for excellence. We often hit it. And when we don't hit it, we review how we can do it better so we can do it, uh, you know, get closer to excellence the next time. Getting into the band of excellence sustaining is challenging to do, but that, I want you to know that we're an organization that's committed to doing that. And the end of the way, end of it, we have to grow enrollment, not for enrollment's sake, but so that we can continue to operate the school and provide the great options that we do now. So this is summary. <coughs> Hit 560 and 22, right? And there are really th only three ways to do it. Uh, we're going to sustain what we got, but we've got to grow this to 560 by 22. That's my goal. And you go, is that, is that realistic? Well, let's talk about next year. So as you know, we're already in re-enrollment. We're in the minds of the school. We're already in the next school year while we finish off this next semester. It's pretty exciting to try to be you know, mentally two places at one time, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So we, we will continue the enrollment growth. And there, I think it's realistic, I'll take you through it. We will strengthen our financial st stability as we do so, again, through the partners as well, good financial responsibility on our part. And what I'm gonna invite you to do is I talked about accreditation, which is happening in March. So we're going to go forward right after that. We're going to, so that's a great process. We get a lot of feedback to the school about how we can, in the next 10 years, how we can continue to grow as a school and, and uh, develop our teachers and uh, develop excellence with our students. So we'll have a great thing, you know, action set uh, to take away from that. We're going to invite you to participate, staff, faculty, families, in the strategic planning process. About five years ago, we did this. And I'll talk about it a little bit more in the Q&A if you want to, but the bottom line is we're going to take a 15-year look, and we'll talk about why at the end why we're doing that, but you're going to be doing basically from April until October. Um, if you're interested and want to be a part of that, 
we're going to invite you to be a part of setting the conditions on how we're going forward really in detail for the next five years. All right, and notice that we're going to extend and enhance our current programs. Important piece here, we have no capacity to add programs. Not right now. There's some programs we want to add potentially down the road, but the, the bottom line is we're going to strengthen what we have right now and do it better. I think that's fair to our teachers and faculty uh, so they can gain some traction in how they're going to do it. All right, so what does next year look like? 530. We're going to get almost half, over halfway to 560. You go, Rooney, that's crazy. That's 42 students. You haven't had 42 new you know, growth like that. That's like, that's a lot. I go, you're right. Well, we've looked at it. We've double, triple checked. So if we just retain 88%, and that's, again, with 86 last year, 88 this year, which means that we're really close in understanding and have your confidence, um, that'll be a key marker. We're shooting for 90 and keep in mind that about 4 to 5% of our families, they just move. I mean, it's not, you know, they're eligible technically to re-enroll, but they move. So that's baked into that. So we have to have a real high connection and confidence rate from you all to hit close to 90. But I want to let you know that's what we're striving for. This works if we get 88 and we gain not 122 that we have right now, but we gain over 130. Right? You put those two together, and you can only vary that just a little bit on either side. You've got to hit both and. And so that's what we're striving for. And I'm confident we can get there. We need your help. I need your, and we'll talk more about how we do that. So next year's budget is in draft, which is good. From your perspective and what we've, we've already implemented, the board approved, is that tuition will increase 2%. My focus here, the board's focus, is to give you parents, you families, predictability going forward. My going in assumption is that you're looking at PCA for the long haul. If you're going to bring your child, you want your child to graduate. That may or may not be true, but I'm going in with that assumption. And what I think we owe you is predictability on how tuition is going to go out. Many of you have that already in your spreadsheets. You have that factored in. And so I want to give you some predictability. I've looked at our history, and they're vet I'm not questioning why they did it. I don't fully know, but it varied. And if we have to change, I need to come to you early. But this is what we look at, just to let you know, is we look at inflation, and we look at the change in the average median household income as a barometer of what's happening in the economy. And we do not want to get ahead of you families. And so that's important. And so in order to keep you and to attract more families, we think that it's really important to keep tuition steady and predictable as low as we can, the way we work our way economically out of this is 560 allows us to get ahead of that. The multiplier here isn't the percentage of tuition increase, it's more students. And so that's where we're going. So what does that really mean in true, in true dollars? So you can see it's about 250 to $315 per student per family per year. It's about $25 a month and I make no light of that. That's, that's a lot of money. As you know, and many of you sacrificed to come here, and I want you to know we recognize this. We've looked left and right at other excellent schools in the area, and you have real choices. So we recognize that, that any change here is, is very real. But just know that we've looked at what does this mean and factored in, and what does this mean to you as a family? And we said, I think that you can, asking you to support this, because this is what this supports on the right. This is what allows us to cover as best we can and frankly allows that budget to work for next year. So there are a couple ways to help offset that tuition. Well, again, in Q&A, we can talk about it a little bit more. They're up on the chart. If you don't know about them and you want to know more, please contact us. Um, but I think you know, one of the things that I'll emphasize, if you can recommend PCA and you've got families here, we want to pass that opportunity along. It really helps us. It helps you. You get another family that you know, like, and love, and they're here, and a lot of good things happen. That, that really helps us because what we find is that, that Elena, to go all the way through from someone who has never heard from about PCA to bring them all the way into time, energy, and attention, to bring them all the way through, frankly, the recruiting process is it, just we save so much time when you bring a family that's already well aligned and it's good fit and it might work and they go, that's it will never work. You go, it could work. I'd love to do it, but it won't work. Yeah, it could work. And if you can bring that, then we can, we can certainly sh you know, share that. 
So this is a this is a slide that many folks didn't ask me to they asked me to consider maybe not sharing, and I thought it's important to share on a couple levels. So this chart here, and, and we we update we checked it. PCA's uh, teacher salaries on average are on the right. On the left are all the, the local uh, public schools. So I've got a lot of staff and faculty in here today. So hopefully this isn't a surprise to you. I want you to know that I'm aware of it as well. I recognize you have choices about where you go and where you may need to go. And I thank you incredibly for what you do to come here. What the students and families tell me is the most valuable and significant part of PCA are our teachers. So I recognize this is not, when I say we've got to do something, this is part of what's not sustainable. And so in order to really make a significant change in this area, and is that we've got to get to 560 as fast as we can. I have no options right now other than basically stay tight, execute well, right? That's what we're doing right now. And our teachers are with us, and we're so thankful for that you are. So. This is important, why we, one of the reasons why we need to get 560. So we looked at the calendar, so shifting is more to enable you to schedule. Um, we can get, this will be online here pretty soon. I've got to give you a better date, but we know when the first day and last day are. We've already laid out uh, the key holidays and events. Uh, we're aligned with the Dover School District. Uh, yes, you'll get two full weeks, two full weeks, Monday to Friday weeks from Christmas. Thank you, Shirley. Actually, thank you, Lord. That's how the calendar <laughs> fell this year. Uh, again, very thankful for that. Um, anyway, some key highlights that I think, you know, as far as your planning and where you may want to, you know, start making uh, preparation for are already, already on the books. So the key initiatives, again, these are initiatives, these are pilots. We're not expanding program, and these are surfaced already ongoing by, by folks that are here that says, I want to do this. So we've got some folks at the upper school who are exploring starting an engineering pilot program because we have interest in it. And there's, we have a teacher who has capacity. She's an engineer. Pretty cool. Another teacher who's interested in helping students in personal finance starting an action this, this, this um, spring is basically a a club type thing and we're looking at hey, what can we turn that into because the students are asking for it <coughs> pretty cool the jazz we have enough jazz you know potential building through people are interested they want a jazz class and so we're figuring out how to do that and how to build that out I mentioned that uh, Lila and the, uh, the creative design center so that's year one of a three-year program so next year is year two of the, of the pilot and a, and a generous donor has enabled us to, to run that on a three-year pilot um, and Dr. Ken Sturgis, if you haven't met Dr. Sturgis, she's amazing, um, is that we're going to integrate that science more and more into that, that hands-on type, you know, the, the kids get to, to not only talk about it, they get to touch it and do it in a way that, that is really cool. And then I, I've, I've been hinting at this, and, and frankly, this is work that we all want to do with, with some of you, is lay the, I call lay the foundation. I want to frame out the idea of, of leadership. When I've looked at schools left and right, I've looked at what they offer and what they say they offer. There's only one school that explicitly says that they work on leadership development. That can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And I don't want to get too far ahead of anybody here. But I looked at what our vision is, christ Center graduates impacting the world for good. I go, what we're talking about is growing and developing young leaders, young men and women, who are not only able to, you know, in a relationship with God, they're able to walk out and do good for themselves and their families and their churches, but they're going to do good for others. They're, I mean, that, that's, you're starting to describe the outlines of a leader, someone who can positively influence others. I go, we're already doing a lot of this good stuff. We need to organize it without adding program. We just need to organize what we're, what we're, how we're doing and what we're doing. Uh, and so we're not going to launch anything next year. We're going to organize it and start to capitalize it as we build out. So... And I mentioned the strategic plan, inviting you to be a part of that. So, if we keep doing what we did in 2021, and we do it again for one more year, we're at 560. That's a really important mark. It's, in some ways, it's two years out. And so, it's a stretch. It's two really solid years. And there's some things we don't control but I just want to put it that that's what we're striving for. That's the mark, and I believe we can get there. I believe that we can all come together, everybody in, 
all hands on deck, communicating the word, telling people about PCA, telling us what we can do differently to do better, uh, we can get there. I've seen, I've already seen the momentum building. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but I've been listening to a lot of you. This is a sketch, and I'm going to go um, before you look too closely. <laughs> um, you all are amazing dreamers about potentials of what could happen without like gold plating anything, about what opportunities we could bring to our children. And one of the reasons we're talking about 15 years, and I was talking to the staff, they go, well, our PCAPers in 15 years, they'll be graduating from that school that we started to describe. What's PCA like in 15 years? Then I had another, another parent said, my graduate who just graduated last year, she just might be bringing her kids to PCAP. And I don't know about you, but I thought, oh, generation's 20 years. For a PCA, a generation's 15. And so I stumbled into it, you know, I went, you know, five years to day, bump out two years, that's good, you know. I have no idea. And so that's really good. You go, well, well, what would it take to do that? Well, we got a grown woman. I think we got to get to 800. You go, Rudy, you're crazy. <laughs> Not crazy. We've been there before. We've been there before with fewer people in the seacoast. Now, you know, population isn't like going straight up, but it's growing. School age population, depending on who you talk to, is at least flat if not growing. We're getting all right. I mean, so I, I we we ask people what's going on. This area up the 16 corridor is growing. Um, I met with the uh, the city manager of Dover. The biggest need for Dover: family housing. Now, it's a need, so there's demand. So how to beat that? That's an open question. But I'm just telling you, that's what they're saying. Um, there's some headwinds though. This isn't all straight easy sailing, otherwise we'd be there by now. So, not everyone wants to see Christian education succeed. Just heard this morning, there's a bill going back next week, gonna be voted on or looked at in New Hampshire about cutting the child tax credit, uh, cutting it in half. That's a headwind we face. I don't know if you know, we have over 90 st students, 90 of your children who benefit from that this year, enable them to come to PCA. So next week, I'm, I'm just going out there. Next week is school choice week across the nation. It is in New Hampshire. I'm going to be down there with two board members on the 30th. I invite you to come down. I know it's, it's going to be, but you know, you can land in many places on school choice, but it's pretty important to us, not just what we do, but I think frankly for you parents, that you have options that are not you know, weighted one way or the other. I will let you know, to get to here, there are some headwinds. And again, I need you to be aware of that and to weigh into some of that as you feel appropriate and feel that. Um, the second is, great thing, the other city manager also told me is, Dover, in his mind, is a great place for families because we have so many great options. So back to school choice, so there's another side of that coin. I think that's great for families. I believe PCA can do well in any competition field. Frankly, I think we do better when we have to and I, I wish every other school well. I believe there's enough, enough to go around, and if we do it all well, then more and more families are gonna to wanna to come to this area. It's good all around. So just know we can get there. The other way is that, is this realistic? So I, at some point, this is straight lines, right? So this is just, you know, in the model, I just put, put it out there. Basically, if we can continue to do this and regrow to where we've been in the past, but just so you know that um, we, we've talked, I've talked to a, a Christian school who's already done their turnaround in, um, South Carolina, I also talked to one in, in New Jersey uh, two, you know, a few weeks ago. They said, hey, look, Mike, do not over-predict your growth. It'll be hard to sustain, but 3 to 5% is realistic. So this is 375 to 5% growth. That can happen. It's going to require a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of teamwork, and we're committed to do it. So I don't mind you, let's go. <laughs> All right? So what can we do? So I think we have out in the back, I want you to leave here today. I'd like to take it home. Wherever you put it up, I, I, just not, I don't have a magnet. I wish I did. But print it out. I'd ask you to put this up and, and consider what we, what we can all do, each of us do. And the first, obviously, is prayer. It's going to require a lot of prayer, reflection, um, support, pray for people, pray for protection in different ways. I'd encourage you to re-enroll. Um, I mentioned before that there are some supporters 
that want to come alongside and think about want to come alongside, guess what? Of those supporters, they're getting a lot of other people asking to come alongside. <laughs> right? They are amazing people who have a great heart and vision for, um, for a lot of things. And one of the things that's, that's just so wonderful for us to tell the story is how much you've come along already in the last two years, but also that you're coming along quickly. Again, if, if we have your confidence and you would re-enroll, that's a key indicator that we are. And we're having these conversations like every week and every other week, um, and it's pretty cool. So uh, no, pri I'm not trying to apply pressure. I'm just telling you, it's part of this. This is unfolding before us. So this other one is a bit more. I just touch on it, and I, I've probably gone over my time here that I wanted, but I appreciate your indulgence. We'd like you to introduce us, and I'll put my myself out, introduce me to some of your friends who might be interested. We'd love for them to come to school. I don't know about you, you come on this campus, pretty amazing. Meet the teachers, amazing. That's a big hurdle for a lot of people. And understandably so, if they, if you, your friends or whoever would like to meet somewhere <laughs> off campus, um, we'll meet them. We'll meet them at Panera, buy them coffee, meet with you, you introduce us. Um, if your church is willing to open their doors, on a Thursday night, Saturday morning, or whatever, and you'd host us in, uh, I'll come. I even think I you know, may, may bring a, a guy I know named Dennis you know, up here who knows the school, but he said he might do that. Um, and, and really just see if it's a good fit for them. Right? There's no pressure. We believe, just to give you a feel, so we did the numbers, so, you know, I believe that Christian education would be a great option for at least uh, 10 out of 100 families. I believe it, I believe it would be. And we just had five out of the families who could come here. We'd be, hit, we'd, you know, we'd be up at 800. Fast. And so I go, there, there's real real potential here. So if you're willing to do this, contact us. Um, just know we're reaching out. We're going to reach out to some of you specifically. I've talked to some of the pastors. One of my main initiatives is to connect with local pastors and be able to do that. Um, and want to do more and more. If you'd like me to meet your pastor, I'd be happy to do so. Right? Because I think at the end of the day, we want to make sure that connection is strong. Ultimately, PCA, Christ Center Graduates, in fact, we're for good. We're, we're reinforcing the churches in our area and, frankly, around the world. All right. We're all in this together. Just to close this out, we're going to go to video and then we'll go Q&A. I don't know about you. Uh, I, I don't look, I'm not a particularly big guy. Got to play some football growing up. And I don't know about, you know, we always wanted to finish the game with mud on our jerseys. Not on the back side, because they got, you know, knocked on our butts, <laughs> but on their front sides. Either way, you wanted mud on your jersey, you wanted marks on your helmet, right? So what I ask you is, let's all get mud on our jersey on this one. It's a happy, it's a fun thing. Get mud on your jersey, and to win, I, if, if that football was my sport growing up. Um, but it's just, I'd, I'd invite you to be a part of that by doing what I'm asking you to do here, and do it with us. All right, James, would you roll tape? Forty years ago, a pastor and his wife answered the Lord's call to open a Christian school in the seacoast. They laid the foundation for a school where Christ was at the center of all things, where students would learn who God is and would adopt a personal relationship with Him through the modeling of faculty and staff who were committed to faithful service, through hands-on biblical instruction, and through community chapel and corporate prayer. In 40 years, Portsmouth Christian Academy has continued to hold Christ at the center, serving as a beacon of His love and light for children in preschool through grade 12, and inspiring the next generation to maximize their God-given potential. By placing an emphasis on each child's individual gifts and talents, PCA offers a differentiated program that provides support or challenge to every child to set them up for a love of learning and lifelong success. Portsmouth Christian Academy students are learners, encouraged every day to reach excellence in the classroom. They are artists, learning to reflect God's image through joyful, creative expression in music, visual arts, and theater. They are athletes, modeling Christ-like character and compassion while competing to the glory of God. They are leaders, prepared to impact the world for good with a counterculture approach that demonstrates Christ-like love and compassion. Most importantly, 
Students at Portsmouth Christian Academy are seen and loved as children of God. They are known and cared for by teachers who see them as a brother or sister in Christ and a partner in furthering the kingdom of God. PCA serves 500 students from more than 50 towns in New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and around the world. These students come from families like yours who have partnered with PCA to provide a nurturing environment for their children where they will be inspired to maximize their God-given potential. Set on 50 beautiful waterfront acres, the nurturing environment at Portsmouth Christian Academy encourages each child to take risks, to try new things, to ask questions, and to explore their faith in a safe place. The results? Christ-centered graduates who know who they are and whose they are, and who are motivated to pursue excellence in higher education, in the workplace, and in service. All to the glory of God. All right, so I changed that from 488 to 530 plus. That's where we're going next year. Join us. All right, what are your questions? Elena. So for folks in the room who have only heard the word accreditation today, what is it and why does it matter to us? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, What's that? Yeah, so the question was, for those who don't know what accreditation is, what is it and what does it mean to us? So where I come from, a unit has to be certified in order before we send it into combat. It's prepared and ready to go. I mean, a simple soldier talk, what we're talking about is PCA has been self-examined. The commander says we are, we are a credible, certified organization and we brought in outside experts our peers who are also certified and they've examined us and they've tested us and they said you are also certified and ready to go part of that is what's a little bit different from a unit going into combat is that you you've self-examined yourself appropriately and you are actually doing what you say you do so we say this in the video do we do it and that's what they're coming to look at and, and do. So when they say you're accredited or you're re-accredited, because we are currently accredited, um, it looks at another, are you doing what you say you're doing and do you have a good, viable 10-year plan? The goal of accreditation broadly, and maybe this is where you're going, is a sustainable, excellent school. So it's sustainable on multiple levels, right? Educationally, with this teacher, and professional development, and financially. So what it means to you is you can have confidence not only in setting your son or daughters here now or next year, but we're on path to sustain excellence for 10 years. So that everything we're asking you to do next year, you can do with, you know, your children would hope and want to say, this could be a great place for us. So hopefully that summarized what it means. So accreditation is a big year, three-year process going in, prepping, um, and then this visit, and then really acting on that. We have to update the accreditation. Uh, Northeast Association of Schools and Colleges, and NEASC is the accrediting agency for us, and they have a Christian school accrediting um, module that we, we fall under, that's what we're going to be tested against, that we have to update them every few years on how well we're doing on that 10-year process. So this isn't just a one and done. So this is a, an entire process. We hold ourselves accountable. It's great to be a part of that. And just so you know, not every school is accredited. Many public schools are not accredited. We are. And we invest a lot of time and, frankly, a lot of money uh, to do that, and largely so that you're confident in who we are and we can follow through on what we advertise. Great question, thank you. Any other questions? Sarah? Is 800 maximum capacity? No, not technically. Uh, and currently within the building. Yeah, so, so it's, the, it's sort of like what's been tested. Current capacity has been tested. I go to, um, there's a vision of having 1,000 on campus. I mean, it could, it could hold 1,000. I think in my own mind, I run at the, you know, the occupancy rate of when it starts to feel overcrowded. Um, 800 is a good number. And if you start to see headroom building beyond that, you st you, the good news is when we, we've looked at some of the models, some options about how we would expand the programs and other things, once you start to get up at 700, 800. So 
The short answer is it's not a cap. But under current construct, it's, it's what we've seen and we've operated well at it. And um, I'd love to have, invite you to a conversation about what, how we have to adapt to that if we need to. With the 800, what's lower school, what's upper school? That's a great question. Um, it's about, to, so I've looked at it, so, so division four, so we're currently division four school is right around 285. So right around 300, so way we're seeing it right now, so of the 500, we have about 160 students upper school. So proportionally, it would be about the same. So we'd love to see, and I have to, I'm, I'm trying to do public math, which is never a good idea. So <laughs> classes are about 60 each, three sections all the way through, if we are able to fill. I mean, that's really what you want to see. And that puts 240 at the upper school, 250. And that's a pretty sweet spot. I mean, we have 100, imagine 100 more kids here. Um, the great thing is, I don't think we've run out of great options. The beauty, one of the beauties that struck me about PCA, and I, I share I share this story, uh, but I think it, it gets to a little bit of a, what I think we still sustain at that size, is I watched uh, Kerry Boot had the, the pep rally down um, in the fall with the, all the athletic teams, and uh, she had a pep band. I hadn't heard a pep band in a while. I heard that she had a pep band. The junior highs were pep. I was like, man, they're rocking, you know, drums and brass and introducing the teams and then she introduced the guys soccer team the entire pep band set everything down got out again <laughs> went out there so here's what we're seeing is the same you know young people who have these great academic options are also playing instruments who are also getting the experience of playing on these teams that are routinely going to play i mean to some degree they get to have it all and i still think that you know there are a lot of great opportunities that we still keep it at 800 so, great question. Any other questions? Were we only meant to get a flicker of the 15 years? I know. Can we go back to that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you were only meant to get a flicker for, for a couple reasons, as you'd imagine. Um, one, one is, yeah. So, one is the board, the board is, that's their job, right? The board and, and there's some great, amazing men and women around the board are looking out that far, and, and we have talked about and we played out the accreditation in the strategic planning timeline um, I would tell you a lot of those ideas are ideas I've heard from you all and for frankly from the board of what they might want to do but I'll, just a couple of things that we broadly were thinking about just a sense one is when we've looked around I've looked at it you know some of them physically almost all of them on satellite and online if I haven't been there there are only two private schools that are on rivers. You know who they are? Besides us, there's one other one. It's Phillips Exeter. St. Thomas doesn't have river access like we do. I'm aware. So, so a lot of them are close to rivers. I mean, how can you not be close to a river around here? But they don't have this. So we're on 46 acres right now, close to 50. Right? Um, rural. So Phillips Exeter is in town. It's a wonderful setting. I'm just saying that we have a unique aspect of where we're seated physically that I think we can differentiate ourselves, we can capitalize on. We'd love to have you have more access to the 46 acres when we're not in session, right? Or even when we are in session, we can figure that out too. Um, you know, as long as it's, you know, copacetic with our, our, uh, our education. Um, that's some of what we're talking about. You know, the things that we're seeing in the future, you know, I have to say we're looking at what industries are, are, you know, do we need to start thinking about that are emerging that we want our students to be involved in. But the spirit of entrepreneurism, the fine arts, and the importance of will, that will not be replaced by AI. This is, you know, the arts are, you know, supremely human endeavor and hopefully God honoring and glorifying. They're all going to be relevant in the future. Um, you know, Eric Deal, one of our seniors, has started, you know, his focus on uh, 3D printing. Marries up with my experience where I've looked, you know, my job I just came from of where we see additive manufacturing, that's what we call it, and what that role is going to be in the future. Still widely unknown, but it's definitely going to be there. It's going to change the way economies work and what enables, frankly, people to have jobs in the future at scales we don't fully understand yet. And the fact that we're just on the cut, you know, cutting edge on some of that, and frankly, for being a pretty pretty modest school in a lot of ways. But it, where I come from, we're a school that hits way above our weight class if we're in Boxer. So we want to sustain that. So anyway, thanks for asking the question. Strategic plan, 
<coughs> look forward to the next six eight months. Um, I think in, in all, I love you know like you, I love to dream big. We've also got to put framework in how we're going to get there. And so I want to leave you here tonight pretty clearly. We have got to, we've got to be focused on 560 by 22. 560 by 22 heading to 600 starts to give us some real options where those strategic plans, visions, and dreams can start to lay, come out. You know, again in the next you know few years. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, just doing the quick math, getting from where we are now to the target number, um, you know, you're adding seven, eight students per grade level. So have, have you thought at all about how that impacts? One of the things that attracted us to the school was the small classroom size yeah. and the, the student to teacher ratio. And how do you deal with that as, you, as we grow? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. And it's a great point. Um, and so, Dr. Boo, Dr. Lawrence in particular, we haven't really addressed it at the upper school because that's where we're going to see that. So the fourth grade, we need to have fourth grade students. So, so yeah, so it's the first time we've, you know, we've got 41 in the, in the fourth grade this year. And so how we manage that growth is a, is a great question and challenge. So there are a couple ways obviously to do it and when we look, when we go to the third section, right? And so that's a, that's, that'll be a great decision to make when we have to do that and how we rearrange our teaching staff to support it and aides to come in behind it. So one of the things we know we have to do is enable and equip and prepare our teachers to deliver the same excellent education to those to your students, to your, your children. And so um, the fourth grade has been a great example for us this year, and we're going to do the after action review on how we how we did that and where we can improve. So fourth grade parents, please engage with us on that as you go to the fifth grade. Um, but I get back, back to communication, and one of the things I did mention is. Um, when I ask you to communicate with us, an observation I've had, and I don't know, this is an open question. So when we're, if, let's just say we're not doing that well. Let's just say your kids are in a class. It's not going well from your, your, your family's perspective. Uh, please don't hesitate to come up on the, and let us know. And then if it's still not working, to move it to me. I mean, our goal would be to satisfy and work with you on that. Um, that's regardless of whether it's this particular question or, or any other. But what I think I've, it's been hard, and it's hard to watch, is when folks don't know, and they're not, they're not, it's just, it's sort of, the families just filter off into the, and it's like, what happened? We don't know. It's, obviously, there was a breakdown somewhere. So I think you've identified a key area that we know as we talked to, so we've had these discussions, of what does it mean to grow? One of the things we've seen is it's not uniform, right? This is not going to happen. Like, oh, they all come in and so we're tuned in, and I would say we've got to stay close uh, to maintain uh, that excellent education. So thanks for raising it, and just know that, that uh, Dr. Boone in particular has already brought it up. Mrs. Russo. So on one of your slides, on the SAT slide, at the end of it you said, you know, we want to we be sure that we are um, focused on preparing our students to better test. Yeah. And for some of us, hearing that makes us think about MCAS in Massachusetts and how teachers are being um, encouraged to teach to the test. Can mm -hmm. you address that? Yeah, that's, good. that's a good question. So w where I'm going on this is, you know, I think we already put out, hey, we'd like you to be well tested and rest of the students for their knee was, right? Just, we just really, you know, it's sort of like uh, if you're going in to see a doctor, you kind of, you know, you're prepped for that test in the sense that there's a good read. We got a good, a good assessment. So that's sort of one level, especially with the NEWA. The SAT, you know, and many of you have been down the path, and, and uh, Christy and I have certainly been down there. Um, what, what I'm talking about is how do we set up some structures within our current methodologies uh, to put real framework around understanding the SAT and maximizing that. So it's really hard to test too. I mean, we can't prepare them for that and dedicate classroom time. Uh, it's really helping them to have the tools to handle what they're going to see so that their aptitude is appropriately measured, right? And I think that's a good different, differentiator. So um, I, I don't, I, I, it would be, it's really frustrating, and we, at least for me, when I, you can start to see that, you know, I've, and we've gone through it with our own children, uh, you know, I'm talking like in major, not just like one or two, like I know you know that. I know you know how to do that, but there are some techniques, as you know, of how to do that. So what we see is there's just some structure. Um, 
you can help realize that real aptitude. And that's what we're after. So the tools are here. So when I look around, most of the stuff, like it's, it's available. It's been here. And some good people, I think I've kind of moved to the point of, let's figure out how we're going to pick some of this up. That makes sense. Okay, good question. Any others? Any other feedback that I can carry either for me? Sarah? Uh, so we, my daughter's in eighth grade this year, and yeah. she's trying to choose between schools. And what I've noticed is that I probably did make an opportunity for her to build community here at this day. I would come and pick her up, I'd go back home, you know, back and forth. She did one sport, so a little bit there, but nothing else after school, really. What do you see as something where we can really work on building community to keep students really thriving here and wanting to stay? Yeah, so the question um, was how can we create more opportunities to build community for the students? Because of, you know, there's this, you know, you come here, go to school, and leave. What is there to stay and be a part of? And build community with. Besides just sports. Not just sports. I said my daughter's in one sport, that's it. Yep. Yeah. On and get out of that. And eighth grade particular. Yeah, well, this is, and looking at the eighth grade lower school. Yeah. What's that? What, what, what did you say, Sally? Eighth grade, eighth grade, eighth grade in particular. particular. <laughs> yeah, so the question in this case was eighth grade. Yeah, I think once you get to the upper school, a lot of other things start to open up. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. I think I, I got to take that on. I don't want to um, get ahead of that. Um, I think, you know, broadly speaking, what we know is for a chance for a sense of community, a sense of belonging, something we all want, all right, God gives us that desire to belong, is you have to have a place, you have to have a reason, and you have to obviously have people, right? It's sort of like fire, you know, you've got to have fuel, heat, and oxygen, right? You've got to have those two things. Well, you've got to play in SPCA. We could have people. We don't necessarily have full purpose yet. Like, why would we come together for that? And so... I think we, we ought to take that on. And um, I, that may or may not be in time to help, you know, you know, as your daughter works through what, you know, what's best for her. But, you know, I, back to how we could do that, um, I think it's an open question. And so, I, but I take it on as something area we, we, ought, we ought to look at. Um, and so, can we, sure. No. They can't hear you. No. Are you having me open? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> James, can you turn this on? This live. There you go. <laughs> Are we supposed to be on the spot? Can you guys hear me? So I'm, I'm speaking more as a parent. Uh, I live far from the school, and we enrolled Dominic when he was in kindergarten, and we had two babies in the car driving up from Massachusetts, um, went through crying spells and toilet training and having to stop on the highway and be scolded by a state trooper for trying to help my daughter know when it was the right time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, so lots of challenge, but I think to Sarah's question, for those of us in the room who do live far, it is harder for us to build community. And so I think tactically right now, the things that we could do are be very intentional about forming those relationships and helping our students to go to events at the school um, attend the birthday parties, invite friends over. It's one of the best ways that you'll get to know your friends and your child's friends and also help them to build those bonds. Because we all know, you know, here at the school, I don't, I'm sure you've thought about this, but if you think about it from the kids' perspective, they're in classes all day and they're meant to be quiet in classes so that our faculty can teach them. That's not a time for them to socialize. At the lower school, they're meant to pass in the schools quietly. Um, and so really their opportunities to connect with each other are at recess and at lunchtime. Uh, and maybe if they're lucky, they can say a couple of words to each other on the way to art. But otherwise, there's not a lot of opportunity for them to socialize and bond as friends here at the school in the same way that I think you and I would want to connect with each other outside of school, have conversations, play together, build with some Legos, create some robots, go for a bike ride, go mountain biking, whatever it is. So I think tactically I would say be very intentional and it's really hard um, being a mom who A, works and many of you are dual working parents and families. 
um, and living far from the school and having multiple children. And so trying to create opportunities for play dates and get togethers, be intentional about that. And then I think continue to provide that feedback to, to Mike, to Dr. Abood, to Mr. Foley. What else can we do? Can we create social activities here on campus that are outside of theater, that are outside of athletics? Because not all of our kids are interested in that. Um, I can tell you my kids love movies and snacks. So you made a movie and snack club, my kids would be all in. Movie night. Movie night, right? Um, I think about the trip to Costa Rica for the seventh graders last year. What a great time of bonding what that was. My son came home and said, one of the coolest things about that trip is I got to know people who I thought previously I didn't really like, and I really came to appreciate who they are, and they're now my friends. Uh, you couldn't have done that if they hadn't had that level of one-on-one -on -one bonding time together. So yeah. that's my two cents. So, Rhea, so this is a, yeah, so a couple things. So to what you probably heard this, but you know, the whole goal of getting as many circles to overlap as possible, right? You, if you can get two big circles to overlap of life, like school or work and where you live, you've got an opportunity for community. Uh, the other one is uh, where you worship, right? So that'd be another way that we see that, that two or three of those can start to overlay. Um, you start to create that. So I go back to where you live and where you, where you worship are, are areas that I think we can we can augment or enable. I mean, part, part of the goal and vision is uh, how do we enable, well, again, while we're not in school, how do you use this time? And we were joking around this morning a little bit. I'll just go there because I, I don't know if we'll do it. But uh, that waterfront, 4th of July, I've noticed that fireworks go on around here, <laughs> right? I, I, there's no no program. What is it? Hey, come on. You know, I don't know, Paul. What do you think? We'll talk about this on one. <laughs> yeah, break, you know, fireworks down in, down on the waterfront, you know, on the, on the 1st, 2nd, or 3rd of July, right? Okay, we have the barbecue. That, again, that doesn't answer your question, but <laughs> several are like that, right? So. School bringing other families here to see this amazing campus. Yep. Um, but that's great. And there are other things. How do we, you know, it's one thing, to, some things to start, some things are already happening. How do you deal with them? So thank you for doing that. A great point. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll pause here. There are some refreshments out back, or I'll actually I'll, I'll pray and dismiss us for time so you can fellowship, or ask questions. I'll be up here for, for a bit. Um, if you want to meet each other, um, that'd be great. But thank you again so very, very much for what you do each day to be a part of Portsmouth Christian Academy, you and your family. More and more time I spend here, I appreciate it more and more. Uh, I did appreciate it, but I appreciate it more and more. Thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for asking good questions. Uh, thank you for participating. And then please contact me offline, mrooney at pcaschool.org is my email. No dots, no dashes, M-R-U-N-E-Y. If you have anything you want to reach me, I, I will available. Give me about 24 outside, 48 hours. I'll get back. But uh, thank you again. Uh, let's close in prayer, and then I'll enjoy some refreshment.